welcome to the Pengana Alpha Israel Fund update. Uh, great to see so many uh, of our investors and friends joining us on the call. Uh, and a big welcome to uh, Sagi and uh, Gabi, um, who are joining us uh, from, from Israel. Uh, the, um, the last uh, uh, past few weeks has, have obviously been terrible uh, for everyone, um, and in particular, um, our colleagues in Israel. Uh, but uh, we are constantly amazed by the great resilience and ingenuity of um, uh, of the people of Israel. Um, and uh, we know that uh, things will come back as strongly um, as they were before. Uh, the the um, today's uh, uh, today's webinar uh, will last about a half an hour. Um, Sagi will talk first, and then Gabi. And after that, we'll have plenty of time uh, for some Q&A. If you look at the bottom of your of your screens, you will see a QA and a box. Uh, please feel free at any point in time uh, to uh, put your questions into the box, and we'll endeavor to answer all of them um, after the 30-minute uh, mark. Uh, without further ado, um, I'll hand over to, uh, to, to Sagi. And thank you for joining uh, today's special uh, webinar on the situation in Israel and about the Pengana Alpha Israel Fund. Uh, we will start by giving a short update on the military situation in Israel. This will be followed by a presentation of the macro uh, and micro positioning of both the Israeli economy and the fund. Uh, and we will describe this from uh, three aspects. First, we will describe how did Israel and the fund enter this crisis? How are we positioned? And how, what is our views going forward? Our aim in this webinar is to reinforce our position that Israel's strong, strong economic fundamentals and tech leadership are here to stay, and that the current short-term discount and in valuations and underperformance of the Israeli market is mainly a result of the non-economical local events as, and is an opportunity for long-term investors. As you've all pre probably been following, we are 52 days into the war, Iron Swords, uh, which was imposed in Israel on the 7th of October uh, with the penetration of thousands of Hamas terrorists to the south of Israel, murdering over 1,300 people and taking 239 people hostages. Israel has set out two clear objectives for this war. Elimination of Hamas in Gaza, which means destroying its military and political infrastructure in a way that Gaza will not be ruled by a terrorist organization. And second, the return of all hostages by all means, either military or political channels. As you all know, three days ago on Friday, a long negotiated deal matured, which with a lot of joy included the release of up till now 39 Israeli hostages. The general agreement, and I will be short on this, are just uh, talking about the following terms. From Friday, a limited five day ceasefire came into effect in which in its first four days, 50 Israeli hostages are to be released. These are only children with their mothers and elderly women. No men or soldiers are to be released. In return, Israel will release 150 Hamas terrorists that are in Israeli jails. Again, only women and men under the age of 18 who have not committed a murder. Israel will receive every night the list of names that will be released the following day. After the four days, Hamas will receive an extra day of ceasefire for additional 10 hostages. We're now in the process of hearing that there will be probably another three to four days and more hostages will be coming back home, which is a great um, news for us. I will say it out loud and clear. The 7th of October is the most horrific tragedy that occurred to the Jewish people since the Holocaust and the creation of the state of Israel. But I have no doubt. We will prevail and become stronger as a nation because our biggest and unique asset is our strength and the resilience and life-seeking people that we are in this country. People who know very deep inside that we have no other choice but to win. Just a short reminder of the Alpha Group. Alpha was founded in 2005. We have over 18 years of expertise in equity fund management in the Israeli capital market. We are a team of 20 people managing 650 million US dollars under management on behalf of private and institutional Israeli and foreign clients. The management of the group has been in office for a very long time with a long-term proven track record. 
I would like to start just by zooming out for a second and see the big picture before we discuss the current year. Israel is an economic success story. There's no doubt about it. Israel has been one of the strongest and fastest growing developed economies in the OECD in the last decade. You can see the acceleration in growth since 2012. In the last 10 years, Israel's average GDP is 4.5%, which is one of the highest in the OECD countries. In the next few slides, I'll show additional impressive figures, but I just want to point out and stress two of Israel's leading demographic assets and characteristics. Israel has one of the highest demographic ratios of a young population under the age of 30. And our natural fertility rate of 3.2 is one of the highest among the developed countries. Both assets are essential components for any country seeking growth. And I want to share with you a crazy statistic. Israel's current population is 9.7 million people. Based on the growth of population and natural fertility rate in the last 25 years, in 2055, one more generation, Israel's population will be 16 million people. That means almost doubling its size. It's like almost building another Israel. It's no wonder that anyone who visited Israel in the last few years noticed the skyline of cranes all around the country. If you look today at other developed countries and you look for growth, it's very hard to find, especially in Europe. You see a completely different picture of an aging population, negative population growth, meaning less than two, and a concern that pension system is in only one generation will not be able to support its citizens. Now I will zoom in and focus on the performance of Israel's economy in the last year and its pre-war positioning. We have entered 2023 after another year of significant growth, being one of the leading economies in terms of GDP, with a 6.5% GDP in 2022. In addition, we have seen low public debt and, high, and, and, and a budget surplus. 2023 has brought to our footsteps two non-economic negative events. The first being the political strong debate on the judicial system in Israel, which thankfully is long gone and dusted. The second is the tragic event of the war, which we are deeply involved in. In addition to that, if you add global effects like the rise of inflation and interest rates and economic slowdown, you can understand the drop of GDP to 3%, which is expected the expected level for 2023. This also brought the rise of a budget deficit and higher public debt. The cost of the war, which is a very important figure, which I will discuss in the next slide, will have a bigger ne negative impact on the budget deficit and the public debt that are indicated here. Estimates are that the budget deficit will rise to 4% and the debt to, debt to GDP ratio will get close to 70. I just wanna note that just about four days ago, recent GDP figures for Israel were released uh, showing that the economy grew at a reasonable rate of 2.8% in the third quarter of this year, following growth of 3.3% in Q2. Israel has additional economic and fundamentals that are putting us in a relatively good current position to overcome the obstacles ahead of us. Inflation, as you can see, is relatively low compared to the OECD at 3.9%. And this is mainly due to our natural gas reservoir, which uh, we found about 15 years ago, which prevented the surge in electricity prices since COVID as it did in Europe. Unemployment is close to historic lows at 3.1%. GDP, GDP to debt to GDP ratio, as I said, is very low, 61%, uh, low in, in, in all aspects relative to US and Europe. But I want to elaborate on the debt to GDP figure because when taking into consideration the war and the economy, um, we should include that and see the effect of the direct and indirect expenses. If we take into consideration a likely scenario, that in the period starting from now, we will have additional three months of fighting in the South with no other engagement on other material military fronts. Um, it is estimated that the cost of the war is somewhere in the range of 70 billion shekels, which is around 18 billion US dollars. A more pessimistic scenario talks about a cost of war of about 100 billion, which is 25 billion US dollars. Israel domestics product is about 1.6 trillion shekels, which is equivalent to 400 billion USD. 
If the cost of the war will be 25 billion US dollars, as I mentioned, which is the more pessimistic scenario, it means the debt to GDP ratio will climb closer to 70%, which is again, is not something we want, but in comparison to Europe and the US is still, as you can see in the chart, is a low ratio. I must also point out that this calculation is without taking into account the American military aid that was just um, authorized in the US Congress of 14 billion US dollars, which will help the cost of the war. As I mentioned, Israel has set its mark as a global tech industry, is, and, 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 which is the growth engine of the Israeli economy. Just to give you an understanding, it accounts for almost 20% of the country's GDP and over 34% of the government income uh, tax and 50%, 54% of total exports. The figures shown in this slide support it in so many ways in aspects what Israel has achieved and what we believe will continue to achieve in the next decade. The expenditure on R&D as a percentage of GDP, which is the highest in the OECD, will continue to be the engine, engine of ingenuity and the development of leading global technologies. Just take a moment to think, and anyone that is visiting now can actually feel and see it, but the amount of collaboration between military and civilian R&D technologies, which are now just being developed as we speak because of the war in fields such as cyber, AI, defense systems, and aerospace. Um, next slide, please. I would like to end my part of this, the presentation by just describing the resilience of the Israeli market. This chart describes a period of 23 years showing the durability of the Israeli market and its ability to return to growth after military operations, wars, and geopolitical turmoils. The arrow next to the event describes the date when the event started in the period of time and the period of time that it took to recover. As you can see, that even in the second uprising, which is in, was in 2002, which was the longest event, it took only three quarters of negative growth until recovering. All the other events on the chart you can see were shorter and there was literally, literally no negative impact on growth. Yes, the big question is, that we all ask ourselves and we do not have an answer is how long this war is going to take. The longer it is, the recovery will take longer. We're now a month into the actual military operation, which started about 10 days after the bloody 7th of October. It is estimated that 15 to 20% of the high-tech sector employees are currently mobilized for reserve uh, soldiers. However, the Israeli tech ecosystem has been largely unaffected by similar conflicts in the past, and eventually we see it thriving through and during challenging times. I want to just share with you one thing that is very evident. Historically, global economic trends have had a greater impact on the capital markets than regional Israeli military conflicts. Previous similar conflicts had minimal impact on the Israeli stock market's performing performance during the conflict. You can see in this chart that the last three major conflicts, the Second and Lebanon War, Operation Cast Lead, and Protective Edge, 90 days after the end of the conflicts, market, markets returned to green territory. In the next slide, you can see it even more vividly, showing the area in color in each one of the slides, which defines the length of each operation, followed by the behavior of the stock market after 30 days and 90 days from the end of the operation. Typically, the market saw a quick recovery in the month following the conflict. I can tell you that during the first two weeks of the operation, the Israeli currency and the stock market declined by about five to 7% respectively. While the declines are more significant than during previous conflicts, both have already started to recover and are nearing pre-conflict levels. As of this morning, the Israeli stock market in November is up 9%. Yes, the big question still lies, where are we now in this chart with the current war? When is this the end of the war? That is the million dollar question. But this is where the big opportunity lies for long-term investors. I will now hand over to my partner, Gabi, to take us through the portfolio. And uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I will not speak 
more in the current war, since Segi already uh, gave you the most of the influence on the Israeli economy. But I will try to explain how it's influenced on our current positions and uh, try to give you a short update on the current portfolio and our expectation for the near future. Uh, since we have a minimal time, and uh, since I assume, I can't see you, but I assume that most of you already know us and uh, the fund strategy, I will go over the fund strategy very quickly uh, uh, and, uh, and go on the three core strategies. So the Pengana Alpha Fund is a long only fund with a downside protection from big crisis in the market. And we have already uh, seen three of those crises in the last five years. Uh, just a quick reminder, it's, uh, it seems uh, uh, long ago, December 18, March 2020, the COVID and unfortunately, October 23. Uh, the fund uses a unique portfolio construction that incorporates three different strategies into one single fund, value, growth, and special situation. It's important to emphasize that uh, these strategies are not implemented in equal way, and they are uh, uh, determined based on the opportunities uh, uh, that we can see in the market at any point of time. Um, quick overview on each one of them. So the value is mainly industrial companies with a distinct uh, technological advantage. Most of those companies are listed in Israel. The growth focus on companies with significant and exponential growth potential. Many of them are much more high tech companies listed usually in the NASDAQ or duly listed. And third, the special situation. The smallest, the smallest allocation in the portfolio, usually one to three to two, especially in a situation in a year. Uh, we usually invest in this strategy in uh, companies uh, where we found some anomalies, but uh, we do not want usually to stay with them for the long, for the long period. Uh, we also have a policy of hedging our downside exposure, which we sometimes refer to as, as, as like a fourth strategy. It is very important and unique strategy. Um, and that's maybe the right time to emphasize this. The Pengana Alpha Israel Fund is a long only fund. And this constant strategy protect us only in a huge crisis, such as the decline in the market of more than 15% in a year. We saw this on uh, uh, March, 2020. Uh, as I've mentioned before, that actually happens three times uh, in the last year. And uh, the most influenced one was uh, during the COVID, but you will see, you, you can see that it's influenced also on our October uh, uh, returns. Um, next slide. So on this slide, I would like to uh, give you a snapshot on our current positioning uh, compared to the positions before the 7th of October. Um, I would like to start by saying that uh, our vast experience uh, has taught us a few very important comprehensions. I think that the first one is not to panic and uh, making very uh, impulsive uh, investment decisions especially during uh, volatile periods. Uh, it's, it sounds easy, but it's not. Events can move very rapidly and often uh, the best approach is to, uh, to be patient before making investment decisions. And Segi just mentioned the recovery in, uh, uh, in the Israeli market on November until now. The second thing uh, that we learned during the years is that the volatiles and of course, turmoil periods can create some exponential, uh, exceptional uh, uh, opportunities, uh, especially for uh, fund managers with a long-term horizon. Uh, for, for the reason above, we are maintaining our high equity exposure and it's important to emphasize. As you can see uh, uh, from our long exposure, uh, we were very optimistic before, as we are today. But the long exposure won't tell you the whole uh, story since there are some changes in the specific 
investments in the fund. Before the 7th of October, we thought uh, that there were many Israeli companies that were traded in a very low price, especially compared to their uh, uh, competitors out of Israel. A big part of it was because uh, of the internal legal issues that we had in Israel. During the war and after a decline in the index, uh, which declined in about 15% uh, uh, in the first uh, 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 few days, we found some more opportunities. Uh, we all understand that some of the companies, as well as the Israeli economy, will be influenced uh, by the war. But on the other hand, if the interest rate will be lower, something that we believe that can happen, and uh, uh, there are many companies that 100%, and I'll give you some examples, but 100% from their income comes out from Israel, it can be an opportunity, especially because most of them decline before the war since because of the legal issues that we have here. Uh, uh, so uh, I'll go over the downside protection quickly. I think that uh, about the downside protection and the hedging, uh, it's almost the same story. If you look on the table, you will see the same numbers. 20% uh, 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 downside uh, protection that protect about 50% from the fund, but the reality is very different. Before the 7th of October, our hedging part was mainly with out of the money put spread. After the first week or so, uh, uh, not only the put options were get into the money, but uh, most of them, the, the uh, on part of them, became very close to be not efficient if the market will continue to drop. Uh, so we decided to make a changes and uh, just to take you to the COVID. We do it on regular basis. Uh, we decided to take some of the money out from this strategy, uh, as we always do, and roll down the put spread uh, 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 to protect us from. Uh, another decline. In addition, because it costs a lot of money, uh, we also used some uh, 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 calls options, sold some call options because it was very expensive uh, and to protect and not pay too much. I will summarize by saying that today we feel that there is a great opportunity in many Israeli equities, but the big risk, which is not disappearing yet, uh, is mainly for the short term. Uh, I think that if we will have a bigger war in the North, that's why we still hold 90% exposure of a, a, a long exposure for shares for Israeli companies. And our downside protection is a bit different than usual uh, because it's most of it is for the end of the year because we believe that until the, until the end of December, we will understand more or less where it should go. Uh, uh, and it covers about 50% uh, of our uh, uh, equity exposure. Uh, on the financials uh, uh, exposure, uh, we find this sector in Israel very attractive. We enter demand with a relatively large holding in finance, uh, more or less 20%, uh, uh, which declined more, much more than the market. Yeah, I think that the index of the Israeli financial uh, uh, dropped, I think, in the maximum about 18%. Uh, it was mainly due to their exposure to the local market. Uh, we assess that the prices of these shares are very attractive, despite the local risk. Uh, and in fact, we increase our holding by uh, buying a similar percent. By you can see it by uh, that we hold a bit more than uh, we hold uh, uh, on seventh uh, uh, of October, which means that we bought much more because the eighteen percent became fifteen percent. Uh, the main two large Israeli banks, Poalim and Lumi, are just for understanding they are doing about thirteen percent return on their capital. Uh, but they are trading in about 80% from their capital. That means a return of more than 15% per annum. Uh, they are also distributed dividends. 
The main problem of this sector is it is very correlated to the Israeli economy. So after the 7th of October, most of the foreign investors just sold uh, at the Israeli banks, and that's the reason for the main dropping uh, during this month. We saw it happens uh, uh, many times, and usually that's the right time to increase the position. Um, so we believe that the Israeli bank are still very attractive, and uh, although it sounds not that sexy investment, it is. It has some uh, a, a huge potential. Um, about the gas exploration, and I'll give uh, an example after. Uh, uh, I will. I think although we slightly reduced our holding in that sector, we believe not only because it's strategic and important for Israel. But since it's also very attractive and trading about uh, uh, a one digit PE, the main reason uh, that we have a bit lower exposure is mainly for the short term because it has some binary risk in a way. Uh, uh, I'll, the last sector that uh, uh, is the technology sector, of course. And uh, uh, as I mentioned before, this sector was almost didn't hurt by the war. Uh, and in our opinion, there are many uh, major opportunities in that sector. So I believe that in the near future, you will even see that we will increase the exposure for the technology uh, uh, in the fund. Um, we are, of course, aware of the situation of uh, recruiting some of the employees for reserve service. But to be honest, the, the impact for now is not that strong. Uh, next slide, please. So just for summarizing the previous slide, where do we see the, where do we see the opportunities? Uh, so there are times for turnarounds investment and special situations investments, and there are times for good companies that are leaders in their segments as a fair price, at a fair price. We believe today is the right time for those kinds of companies. Excellent management, not too leveraged, and the high growing sector. A few short examples are just the sectors that I touched before, like the energy that we still, although we uh, have a, a bit lower position, we are still bully, bullish on the sector. I'll give you a short example on the one of our biggest holdings, Tamar Petroleum. Uh, the defense sector, uh, I'll try to put, go over it very quickly. You already probably remember the example of the FMS company and the, te the technology, of course, that we are still very bullish on the Israeli high-tech and especially semiconductor uh, uh, segment. Uh, three of our major technology investments are Telsys, NICE, and Comtech. Um, I think that uh, uh, considering time, uh, let's go to, let's move to the examples. So Tamar Petroleum is a great example of our exposure to the gas exploration in Israel. Uh, Tamar has no, actually has no direct business except holding about 17% of uh, the Tamar Reservoir. Quick review on the numbers will show us that the company generate about, I think, $65 million net uh, uh, on a market cap of about 350. That actually give us a uh, multiple of about five. In addition, and very important from our side, uh, at the beginning of November, during the war, and at, at, at the times that Tamar stopped working because of uh, 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 the missiles. One of uh, its major shareholders, which actually hold about 24.9% uh, from the company, uh, makes a tender offer for 5% of the from the company with a premium on the market cap. Uh, the fund has an intention to accept the offer. Um, one of the reasons is that uh, we believe that we have a significant, uh, a, a different way to expose uh, uh, the fund to Tamar uh, Reservoir and still enjoy the benefits of the uh, control struggle in Tamar Petroleum. Um, I'll go to the maybe the last uh, uh, example, considering time is, in, uh, um, let's move to Telesis. No, no, the Telesis. 
yeah. So Tess, I think it's a, it's a company that uh, that's the first time uh, uh, we give you the uh, the name in the in, in the presentation. It's one of our biggest success investment. Uh, the company legacy business is uh, import and marketing and electronic uh, components, uh, but it wasn't the reason for the big success. The growth engine is a company by the name of Verisite, a subsidiary of Telsys. Telsys holds about 72% from the company uh, uh, that manufactures SOMS. SOMS is a system on model, uh, mainly for the electronics industry. Verisite has taken a leading position uh, in the SOM industry with more than 45% operating margin for many years and double digit uh, growth is expected in the coming years years it's already happened in the last five years the company market view yeah, market value is about 450 uh, uh 450 445 uh, uh, million us with no debt and consistent uh, dividend distribution actually they are distributing older uh, net profit every year in 2022 the company uh, uh, sales was about 90 million us Growth of 63% year over year and operation profit of about 26 million US dollars. Um, I think considering time, I'll end here and uh, uh, move it again to Russell uh, for the Q&A. Uh, we'll kick off uh, with first question. Um, uh, can you give a um, an understanding um, uh, to investors about what the war in the north might the might the implications of a war in the north be on uh, uh be, be on the fund so we we are obviously you know uh in a in a in a point of time where the north uh where we have uh, hezbollah uh is not uh quiet but it's not yet in any form, uh, in any form, uh, you know, described as a as a as a confrontation, um, we have been taking um, people from the north, uh, which live uh, four to seven kilometers from the border, uh, and brought them uh, a bit uh, further out um, to areas where. Um, um, which are about 15 to 20 kilometers from there. Um, and we are uh, very, very much pushing on both uh, political uh, and UN um, to have the resolution uh, which says that the Hezbollah cannot be um, as close as they are to the border and have to move to the uh, agreed lines which is uh, beyond the uh, Litani River uh, in, in Lebanon. We really, uh, from what we are, again, we're not experts, uh, you know, in, in geopolitical events, but we're reading and we're seeing the assumption in Israel is that there won't be another front um, in, in the north um, in, 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 in any way of shape that will, um, uh, you know, be similar to what we're seeing, obviously, in the south. Um, but I think the major thing that we have to be concerned of is getting um, the reserve people uh, that are now uh, doing both in the South and in the North, uh, their duty to um, come back um, and, 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 and get back into the working force and leaving the, what we call the uh, regular army uh, to do his uh, job, which uh, is is the normal job of protecting the borders. So, Sagi, I think, I think the question was more, was more focused yeah. on the impact of if there was war in the north, and obviously there's no guarantee or certainty that there will or there won't be. But what sort of impact would that have on the fund, and would the downside protection strategy um, to what extent would, would that protect you? Mm. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to uh, uh, to describe how it's gonna uh, 
the the portfolio today is uh, as i mentioned uh, at the beginning is about 90% uh, long exposure but it has also uh, if you'll get your uh, 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 monthly summary you see that the net exposure is about 70 the reason is that we have a cylinder cylinder is like a, a put spread that protects us from uh, uh, declining the market and we also have uh, a sold uh, uh, out of the money uh, call options. The reason is, the, and, and, and it's all for the end of the year. So how it's influenced, we believe that if uh, uh, something in the note gonna happen, it's gonna happen in the next month or so, okay, because we are uh, dealing with the situation today. We covered about 50% from our exposure, 50 uh, from our exposure, uh, uh, by those uh, put options. Again, it's only if it's going to influence, it, it will have a significant influence because that's the only thing that we are afraid of. And uh, from our point of view, that's a great, it, 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 it's a bad thing for Israel. It's a good place to be for investments because we covered most 50% from our exposure and we'll have the opportunity to uh, 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 to buy some more things. And and, and um, uh, uh, Gabby, um, uh, how much has that cost you? So since it was quite expensive, which means that that's why we did it by uh, a put spread first to lower it for to, to lower the uh, the cost, and that's the reason that we did it first time in the fund, I think, or maybe second through cylinder to 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 do it much lower. I think today. Uh, we did it for two months and it cost us about 0.5%, uh, not more, uh, actually less, actually less than 0.5, because it's only for two months. Okay, and that's covered you for 50% uh, of the downside in a catastrophic uh, scenario. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, I, I should be very careful here because it's a it's a it's a put spread. Although uh, actually we uh, uh, we buy put options and we sell put options, but again, just if the if the market is gonna drop more than twenty five or thirty percent in the next three uh, 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 one month, then we we might won't be cover uh, on the fifty percent again. That's something that never happened in Israel. Okay. Um, uh, moving on, um, where do you feel Israel is in the interest rate cycle? So I'm uh, usually I don't like to speak about macro, but it it is obvious. Uh, 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 we should publish, I think, today uh, uh, the interest rate. So it is obvious that it won't be higher. So we believe that in in uh, in today's uh, meeting that the the interest rate is going to stay on the same level uh, it is. And in the next few, maybe next month or two, probably they're gonna, it's gonna be lower a bit. Uh, I think that the most important thing that uh, was afraid was during the war that the uh, currency, the shekel uh, compared to the US dollar was uh, a start from 4.8 uh, 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 and went into 4.2 just to clarify, today the exchange rate, uh, uh, shekels and US dollars, is lower than uh, uh, the shekel actually is stronger than it was before the uh, the war, which we believe going to help the interest rate be much, not much, but 0.25 uh, at least uh, in the next uh, coming months. And, and and just a related question to that: what impact? Uh, will that exchange rate uh, uh, cycle have on uh, your um, quite significant exposure to the banking sector? No, no, that, that, that's good for the oil market. Uh, I think that the influence on the uh, interest rate, of, of the interest rate when it was lower and then higher and maybe lower in the next future, is much more uh, significant than the war. Okay, that's... Uh, uh, um, for the banks, usually people think that it's not a good thing if the interest rate is going to be lower. That's not the, that's not true. That's that's going to be true if the uh, interest rate will go from four seventy five to zero, uh, and then uh, it it's it going to be a problem. We don't see it happens. And uh, in, in, in this kind of levels, 
it helps the economy, helps all the business that uh, we invest in. Uh, so we don't see it. Uh, we see it as a, as, as a great thing. Okay, fantastic. Um, next question is about uh, the Israeli real estate market and what's your views there and are there opportunities there? So again, we are going to the interest rate. Uh, um, it's, 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 a, it's a very difficult question. We believe that uh, uh, we saw in the last year that uh, the real estate in Israel was stable, okay? Maybe a bit uh, uh, lower prices. The problem is that the prices weren't uh, uh, cheap at all in the, in the last, uh, in the last uh, uh, two years. Uh, but you won't see many transactions. The problem is not with the real estate. I think that the situation here is, the, is with the company, with the Israeli companies that invest in real estate and build uh, 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 building in Israel. The main reason is because they were too leveraged and most of them has a huge problem with the interest rate today. So that's why I think that's going to uh, be the one that uh, uh, be much more relevant. Uh, I believe, okay, my personal, uh, uh, I think, uh, thinking is that the, the real estate will stay stable, maybe 5% lower than today, uh, but because of the big demand and uh, no one is uh, selling, uh, uh, it, won't, uh, it won't go uh, uh, and be lower than that. And the big opportunities, and there are some big opportunities, going to be in a companies that have a great real estate, but because of they were too leveraged, you will be able to buy it in a very cheap uh, 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 money. Okay, great. Um, looking beyond uh, the, 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 the current conflict um, and, you know, whether it's um, weeks or months until um, it's largely over, um, do you see any longer lasting impacts on the way uh, the portfolio will be positioned or on the way you invest money uh, based upon this conflict or will things just turn to the, the same um, uh, modus operandi as they were before? Um, I'm, I'm, I, I think that uh, that's why we present the before and after uh, uh, positioning of, of the portfolio. There are some changes uh, and, and we might, We'll see some other changes in the future. Depends where it go, uh, uh, where it will go. I think that I uh, uh, said that the technology gonna be, uh, I think, uh, even in a higher position in, in the in the portfolio. Uh, I think that the the Israeli banks will be a bit lower in our exposure uh, if we believe if what we think gonna happen in the next month or two. Uh, uh, they will. Uh, we will move them into the previous uh, uh, holding percentage. The real estate is a big question. I must admit, uh, uh, your previous question. It's a big question because if we'll see that uh, uh, that the interest rate will be a bit lower, then we might increase our positioning uh, in the in the real estate. And uh, so, so I. As a long-term investor, okay, you will never see in a, in, 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 in a week that we will change the whole portfolio. Okay, so so it's it's like small steps. We uh, uh, depends on a few questions that we have, but you will see a bit more of the technology, maybe more real estate and less uh, uh, financials. Fantastic. So we've uh, passed the, uh, we're just on the uh, 45 minute mark. Um, and um, so I think that was our expected timing for the session. So we'll uh, we'll we'll stop there. And uh, please, if there are any additional questions, we're always very pleased to take them and to answer them. Um, please feel free to to email us. Uh, Sagi and Gabby, thank you so much for your time. Uh, Pink on is thank immensely you. proud uh, of our involvement with Israel and having a fund investing in Israel, uh, and immensely proud of our relationship uh, with Alpha. And uh, may you guys uh, keep uh, keep safe and go from strength to strength. Thank you, everybody. Uh, appreciate everybody's support. Um, uh, we've got a, an absolutely great bunch of investors uh, for this fund, and uh, we thank you really, uh, you know, for your continuing support uh, and involvement with the fund. Thank you, everyone.